Uh, greetings from the steeply uplifted uh, southern foothills of the Sierra Nevada. Okay, the southern Sierra Nevada. You can see the terrain here is mildly sketchy. Got some landslide action over there. Yeah, oh yeah, see she's looking at it right now. What we're looking for is a pretty rare plant, okay, known from the area. Uh, you know, only a handful of occurrences. It's got a very weird ecology. Now, I've shown you this before if you've uh, been familiar with some of the uh, videos from about this time last year. But uh, we're just going to do a quick banger uh, intro to this, show you what it's about, show you what's going on, uh, make it easily digestible for the short attention span generation, and move right along. You can see we got the, some interesting stuff growing on these, uh, this manzanite escarpment, okay, quartz manzanite. Basically an intrusive igneous rock, somewhat similar to granite. You can see up there you got a species of Phacelia. Uh, right here, it's just the uh, remnants of the invasive, uh, what looks like a Sahara mustard, a species of Brassica. Uh, over here you got the, you got the Agmispan, Fabaceae. Got a nice lupin, same family, Fabaceae. Uh, let's see what else we got going on and uh, let's try not to break our asses. Do you like granitic sand? Huh? Not very stable with the rain, though. You could see just a tiny little gully came here and it opened up uh, what appears to be about an eight foot deep, uh, you know, just basically landslide on the side of this mountain. Ooh, look, it's a species of nicktag. A species of, uh, looks like it's a marab. A marabolus. Okay? Notice the opposite leaves. Now, some of these, if they're not flowering, can, uh, you know, can kind of dupe you when you're looking for rare milkweeds, like out in the desert, say. Some of them can. It depends on what species of milkweed you're looking for. But they can resemble milkweeds, because milkweeds also have those opposite leaves. But then, of course, when you get closer and, you know, take a look at them, you see, you tend to see a lot of those glandular hairs. And, of course, the flowers are that giveaway. You know, not, but it's, it's not, it's not as sleepiest at all. It's one of the nick tags. A lot of the nick tags have opposite leaves. Almost all of them do. Remember, the nick tags have petaloid sepals too. So they don't have true petals. Those pink, those pink shits you're looking at, those are the sepals. And then of course, they, they tend to have the flowers grouped together in a little involucre, in a little cup. Okay? With the, with the bracts on it. See those, those two bracts sub, subtending that top flower right there? A lot of cool, a lot of cool genera and species in the Nictagenaceae, the four o'clock family. Orders Caryophyllales, same order as beets and uh, cacti. Here we go, this one's a pretty odd bastard. This is a species of dotter, Coscuta. Once you learn about it, you never forget. Always looks like some uh, jackass sprayed a bunch of silly string all over the plants. Families Convolvulaceae, morning glory family. Now some species of dotter are hemiparasites, that is, they can photosynthesize a little bit and produce some of their own carbs. But a lot of them are hollow parasites, which means they just got to steal from uh, whatever plant they're uh, parasitizing. Okay, in this case, it's a species of Eriogonum, one of the buckwheats. Sometimes if you get up close, you can see the little hostorial connections uh, through which they, uh, they, you know, stick into their little uh, host plants and steal from them. Stick into the vasculature. Now, now this is juicy. This is nice. Haven't seen this guy in over a year. Okay, and it's because it's an annual. Not over a year, but I guess it's been about a year. This is a plant called thistle sage. Okay, salvia cardioidea. It's real showy. Look at it. A showy prick. Those uh, verticillasters, those uh, round inflorescences that uh, basically encircle the entire stem axis, those are covered in wool. And they're spiky as hell, too. Resist their bivory. Look at the goddamn anthers on those. Huh? Look at the anthers. Bright orange, okay? And then those uh, lower lip, okay? Those, you know, because it's a zygomorphic corolla. It's not round. It's only bilaterally symmetrical, not uh, radially symmetrical. The lower lip's all frilly. He's got the frilly shit on him. Okay? That's gonna get you know. That's gonna get the pollinators in there doing their business and uh, whatnot. You know, undoubtedly, you got those damn trichomes in the wool all over the all over the plant. You can see why they call it thistle sage because it looks like a goddamn thistle. Get some of those invasive bromes out of there. 
could show you that. Now you also got Chia over here too, Salvia uh, Calambarie. But I just, I seen some down away, but I don't know where the shit have went now. Much more diminutive plant in a, you know, a, a purple instead of a violet, like a darker purple. Okay, so important to note here, ecologically, is you got these damn rodents. I don't know if they're K rats, kangaroo rats, or what, but they're all over. We've seen them all over the road. You know, they're digging holes in the road. They're, they love these boulder piles. They love these boulder piles, and uh, they love some of the plants that grow here, especially Ribes cursatorum, which is a bushy, a bushy little shrub. I'll show you up the way a little bit because they can hide out in them. Okay, they can hide out from the hawks and the owls. You can see one of those little bastards drag one of those uh, uh, thistle sages in there, and then I guess he decided he didn't want to eat it after all. Okay, I don't know, you know. Just a second guessing, bit off more than he could chew, you know. He goes into the grocery store, thinks, you know, his eyes are bigger than his stomach. Okay, I do that sometimes, you know. Can't really fault them. But I'm mentioning it because it plays an important part you know, the plant I'm about to show you. So you got these goddamn rodents everywhere. They're ubiquitous. Little kangaroo rats. Yes, they're cute, but they probably carry hantavirus and soul virus and maybe some other weird shit you don't want to touch them. But just admire them from a distance, you know. Kind of like you should do with most people. Admire them from a distance. Don't want to get too close, you know, at least at least when they're grouped together in a large group. Okay, see, there's the other species of salvia. Another annual, not a perennial, Okay. Only alive for about four or five months, then produces a ton of seed, then dies. And they germinate again next year. Different plants do it is. This is a Salvia columbariae uh, chia. They call it the chia. But the actual chia is the ones you get in the, the chia pet. I mean, what the shit? I think those are Salvia hispanica. Okay, but you could eat the seeds out of any of them. All right, pretty gelatinous, pretty nice. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking of redoing my delivery. I know it's a little abrasive. Some people don't like the cursing. So what we're going to do, we're going to make it a lot more white, okay? And I'm not referring to the melanin content in your skin or the lack thereof. Think culturally white. Think super lame. Think NPR. Think soft-spoken voices, okay? Think, uh, you know, a, a fear of offending people. And think of, uh, you know, very non-confrontational, watered-down, uh, cherry-on-top type of... Uh, of a, a conversation, okay? So here we go. We're gonna try it. Yeah, yeah, well. Okay, yeah, here. Here's a very interesting plant. This is a species of Canactus. This is a member of the sunflower family. Okay, and I want you to pay attention to those corolla shapes, okay? Each one of those tiny flowers, okay, grouped together in what's called a capitulum, have a very distinct corolla shape. Now, what this plant is good for is you can make a poultice or a tincture out of it. And uh, it's just good for stopping circular thoughts. It's very grounding. It's very rejuvenating. Uh, my elders, even though I'm white, uh, they told me that this is a uh, was a very important plant in plant medicine. Okay. Now I actually prefer people don't call it by its Latin name because that's the colonizers' language. Okay. So let's well, let's call this by what we know it as motherwort. Okay. Motherwort. Very uh, very important piece of plant medicine right there mm. yeah wow okay gonna keep doing as much as possible to make sure that uh, botany stays as boring and inaccessible to as many people as possible here wow anyway okay i can't even do it it just makes me die a little bit inside just threw up in my mouth want to show you this plant though very interesting very interesting plant one of the most beautiful milkweeds in california it's it's named california milkweed you can see it's just getting going like most milkweeds Except for one or two of them, it comes back from a perennial rhizome. So the top dies every year, but you've got a root down there that stays alive. And then, uh, you know, due to the proper signals of moisture and warmth, it sends a, a shoot up uh, in the spring. This is Asclepias californica. The flowers are absolutely gorgeous. you got those nice uh, reflexed uh, sepals, okay? Actually, petals, excuse me. The sepals are, are smaller. Pink reflexed petals. Then you got the five hoods around a gynostegium, around a corona that are bright pink, really going off, really showy, really showy, bastard, but you're going to have to wait about a month or two to see it. You can see, like a prick, I, uh, you know, just scraped the top of the leaf right there to verify that it was indeed the plant in question, Asclepias californica. Remember, all the milkweeds bleed that latex containing those wonderful cardiac glycosides in them, very toxic compounds. It's coming up at the base of uh, Eriogonum radii. One of the buckwheats, one of the 9,000 species of buckwheats out there. Perennial buckwheat right there. 
So anyway, this guy be going off. There's last year's stock. You know, it only gets about, I mean, it can get, they can come out to about here, you know, kind of sprawling. Okay, very gorgeous plant. And again, it's covered in those, that the white palmentose coating of hairs, that indumentum, that fuzz. It looks like we're getting some hot metamorphic action right here. You can see the squeeze, see those striations, the squeeze on this intrusive igneous rock, this manzanite, okay? But it's low-grade metamorphism because it's super crumbly. It's not that hard. If you cook the rocks long enough with enough pressure, they get pretty hard, okay? You bonk someone in the head with that, they're going to fall down. With this, they might just, you know, they might just get mad at you and then come running after you. See, this stuff's super crumbly, huh? Just, just look at that. Just made sand. It just made sand in my hand in a matter of 10 seconds. Okay, everywhere you hear the damn ground squirrels making this uh, chirping noise. They got K-rats everywhere. We saw a bunch of toads in the road last night. Okay, all banging each other in the middle of the street. And up there, just by that oak tree, okay, you could see, which is probably a Quercus de Glossii, a blue oak. You could see that the that little... Uh, rock pile with the shrubs around it. Those shrubs around it, the Ribes cursatorum, the oak leaf gooseberry, and that's our target. That's where we're going right now. The vein, find the vein. Look at that. Nice, nice vein of uh, what appears to be, almost, it looks like quartz, you know? Actually, maybe it's just, the uh, could be a type of plagial clays. I should really sh shut my mouth before I actually get a chance to look at these closer. Very large grains in there though. How about that? Okay, there's our target habitat right up there. You can see the Quercus de Glossia and Aribes cursatorum. Now, this is not the, a rock wall that was built by ancient aliens, okay? It's not the remains of a rock wall. This is just an outcrop of granite that uh, protruded more, was more resistant to weathering and erosion than the surrounding area. Now, this makes a lovely soil, okay? Granite, the, or monzonite in this case, actually, this seems to be almost pure quartz. That explains why uh, it's here, because <laughs> obviously quartz is a lot harder than the surrounding granite and a lot more resistant to erosion, okay? But uh, the surrounding granite or monzonite, whatever the shit this original rock was, uh, you know, that left this quartz vein, this massive quartz vein, uh, you know, it doesn't just make a wonderful uh, granite the countertop, it also makes a wonderful soil, like I showed you before, because it breaks down so easily it forms that nice uh, that nice sandy substrate okay so here we are up at the habitat and already from far back i can see the target plant in question the calico monkey flower the black hole monkey flower this is the placus pectus looking like uh you know it's the blown out the crackhead rat fink eye uh, looks like the flowers are already starting to senesce that is that uh, we're in a post anthesis state these flowers have already been pollinated Okay, fruit should be maturing in about, I don't know, four to six weeks. And, uh, of course, the seeds, I believe the seeds are spread by the rodents. So the rodents play, uh, you know, a, a, a big part in the ecology of this plant. You can see this thing is just covered in trichomes and little irritating hairs, so the rodents don't really want to nibble on it. Uh, it probably tastes like hell, too, probably full of uh, some uh, very potent secondary chemistry. But the rodents create the habitat upon which this thing grows. You could see you got these, uh, what I would just call scurry paths around this little island of uh, granite boulders and Ribes cursatorum, the oak leaf gooseberry. And so they create the bare soil upon which the plant needs to germinate, okay? Because it can't compete with all the erodium, okay? That pink flower, the erodium and the invasive grasses and bullshit. You know, for those of you that don't know, the whole Central Valley has, has had a massive disturbance to its ecology in the last two or three hundred years due to cattle grazing and, you know, more so it, the importation of noxious weeds, mostly from the Mediterranean in South Africa. So all the, all, the, all the grasses and shit you see, all the golden hills of California and all that corny bullshit, those are all invasive species, okay? They're not, they're not, they weren't here 400 years ago. Some of them weren't even here 100 years ago. But anyway, so this plant gets out-competed pretty easily by those invasive grasses. Uh, maybe it grew, you know, 500 years ago. Maybe it was a commonplace plant uh, throughout all these hills. But now, this is the habitat it's restricted to. You will only find this plant growing in that little two or three feet wide area of bare soil that surrounds these, uh, these goddamn uh, little islands of uh, Ribes cursatorum and oak boulders, or uh, granite boulders, excuse me. 
Okay, who tried dragging a dead cow in there? Who, who, who tried pulling the dead bones in there? A variety of animals used this habitat. That was probably a fox or a badger. Okay, here's that Ribes Curse of Torm again up close. Done flowering. Fruit's already maturing. You can see why they call it the oak leaf gooseberry. Look, there's a fresh fruit in there. Ready to go. Ready to get snatched off by a bird. And, uh, you know, have the seed deposit somewhere else. You got the nodal spines. Nodal spines as opposed to internodal spines, okay? Almost looking like, well, they look like stipular spines to me. Okay, diagnostic factor on a lot of plants. Did the uh, spines occur in between the nodes or at the nodes? You got a very important habitat here. Okay, you can see there's more over there. Okay, because this gives this gives all the little shits, all the little rodents and, and whatnot, opportunity to hide out from predators, whether they're coyotes or hawks or whatever. Look into my Diplacus pictus. So, like I said before, this plant it needs these uh, little scurry paths created by the kangaroo rats, okay? Some of it's probably created by them excavating, digging their little holes and doing their ratty things and whatnot, but uh, but most of it's just created by them running around this uh, almost circular island of ribes and granite boulders. So a nice uh, Scrofularia californica right there. California bee plant, they call it. Okay, so these these uh, this bare soil creates the refugial habitat for this thing to uh, do its thing without being outcompeted by the native grasses, okay? Make, ensuring that it gets the bare granitic sand that it needs to grow, okay? This plant's only known from Tularian current counties in the southern Sierra Nevada uh, uh, foothills on a west slope, okay? Super rare plant, okay? And you'll never find it growing anywhere else. You'll never find it growing out in the open. Always around the Ribes Cursatorum in a uh, granite boulder outcrops. Pretty magnificent. So you lose those kangaroo rinse for whatever reason, and you lose the plant, okay? This plant is entirely dependent on those K-rats. You know, again, you, just another example of everything's, everything's connected and with this shit, okay? Even you, you prick, you're part of everything else, all right? So don't get cocky. Look into my uh, Diplacus pictus. Please look into my Diplacus pictus. Please. Please. Little, like a bloodshot crackhead eyeball. <laughs> like a rat pink guy. Oh, look, he's got some He's got some little glands on the inside of that Corolla. Yeah, how about that? Okay, there's one of the flowers. Don't worry, this was a... a old flower it already you know senesced off the uh the ovary so uh this corolla i didn't rip a corolla off a, a flower that was still uh awaiting to be uh pollinated anyway you could see that the lower petal is covered in those little uh those little glands you got the four uh stamens right there with the yellow anthers the stigma of course is uh still attached to that fruit the style and stigma but let's take a closer look right here it, uh, what's going on inside the flower because there's something pretty interesting now you get up close you get get close and you can see you see those little studs on the uh well first off they're only on the lower part of the corolla right there they're only on that uh, lower petal not on the lateral petals or the top one and what those basically do is ensure that any of the pollinators that come to pollinate this thing uh, can't crawl back out they must crawl uh, inward into the black hole and then, of course, come in contact with those anthers or that uh, stigma, and then they can fly out. So those studs basically, uh, you know, force whatever the goddamn pollinator is to go in there and actually come in contact with, uh, with the uh, sexy parts of that flower. Pretty goddamn remarkable. What a wonderful plant. And again, very rare. Only known from a handful of locations. And again, only known from the goddamn Ribes Cursatorum uh, Islands. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands, wash your ass, especially if you're out of toilet paper because all these fucking mouth breathers are hoarding it. And uh, try not to breathe. Anyway, happy pandemic 2020. I love you all. Go fuck yourself. Bye.
Nope. Not here. Just a lot of cow shit. Might be a more thorough right there. Who doesn't love the smell of liquid cow shit? Liquid cow diarrhea. What a wonderful animal. Dumb as a brick. Easy to control. Ugh. Fucking heinous. Ah! This is, this is why I don't eat burgers. Huh? I'll eat a piece of bison once in a while. You won't catch me touching a fucking burger. It smells like ammonia. Just that smell of shit and piss. The poor bastards are dumb as bricks, too. You're nothing like your great, 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 great grandfather's the Orox. Horrible. I'm not even vegan, you know? I don't think the, the fucking diet's not a bad idea, but they can't keep the proselytizing out of it. You know, vegans technically kind of annoy me, at least when they open their mouths a lot. But holy shit, this is why I could see going vegan. Look at these fucks. The fucking smell. You could smell this from fucking three miles away. It's, oh, God. Oh, look at it, those vacant eyes. Oh. They can't keep shit out of the out of the meat either, you know that? They gotta sterilize it with ammonia. Huh? All American diet for those sedentary lifestyles. You barely move, but you shovel fucking hamburgers into your mouth, you know, upwards of a dozen times a month at least.